there we go. Hey guys, I'm Sarah Louise Ryan, a dating expert and matchmaker, and I am here with the glorious dating dad. Welcome. Thanks very much. I've been described as many things, but glorious rarely. <laughs> well, you said a lot of nice things about me on your podcast earlier, which I probably wouldn't have uh, described myself as, so I appreciate that too. Absolutely. Well, I, I never lie about that sort of stuff. So every word I said was true in that regard. Um, so how are you keeping up in lockdown? I would say I'm living the dream, but you know, that would be more of a dystopian nightmare at the moment. It's not easy, is it? I mean, just, just, just standard living isn't easy in this kind of experience, let alone uh, in my position, uh, living with kids running around half the time as well. So that's trying to hold down a full-time job whilst desperately trying to write and record and, and do fun things. It's crazy how much I'm trying to fit in and how much time I've got, yet how much time pressured I am in so many respects as well. Do you feel like you actually do, given that you're still working and you're very fortunate to be still doing that, and, and, you, and you've got, you know, kids as well, do you feel like you do have spare time on your hands? Sometimes I do, yeah. I, I'm lucky that I, well, unlucky in some respects, but I only have my kids half the time. So the other half of the time, I'm, I'm basically sitting in my house by myself doing nothing. And yeah, for a while it was a case of, okay, well, I can just binge watch Tiger King and just play computer games as if I was 15 years old again and all those sorts of things. Then I realized this is, a, this is an opportunity in a way that I've never had this opportunity before because I would have spent my time going out and drinking and partying and going to restaurants and seeing friends. Now I've got an excuse, ready built excuse not to and to just spend time doing what I want to do, to learn some new things, to, to kind of do some growing and all those sort of um, concepts and just do those things without any fear of missing out on anything. So it's kind of the anti-FOMO. JOMO. <laughs> yeah, JOMO, I'm full of JOMO at the moment. <laughs> That's what they call it, the joy of missing out. Like when you haven't got FOMO, you're uh, well, create, creating joy, I mean, wherever you possibly can at the moment. Um, so what, what are you doing spending your time, uh, yeah, what are you spending your time doing when you're not with the kids and you're not working? How are you thriving and taking stock and all of that stuff? Well, um, I, I'm doing a few things. Um, uh, first of all, I truly believe that sp time spent enjoyed is not wasted. So as long as I'm doing something I'm enjoying, I don't feel like I'm wasting my evenings. And sometimes that might just be finding, I, I've rediscovered vinyl. Uh, I bought a record player last year and the act of, putting a record onto a record player, hitting play makes me listen to it in a way that just hitting shuffle on a, a playlist on Spotify, I never will. So I'm, li I'm enjoying music again. I'm, I'm rediscovering the works of Bowie and uh, Stevie Wonder and the classics that I often li listen to the odd song, but never album. So I'm enjoying that. And combined with that, I figured I'm also gonna try and learn a skill. So my, my youngest daughter, she's learning the piano just because she decided to. So I'm, cool. I've secretly decided that whenever she's not here, I can bring the, the little the, the keyboard, it's on these massive keyboards, bring it downstairs uh, out of a room and I've started learning chords and learning a few bits and pieces. So when this is all over and we eventually go out either to uh, a pub or to a, or a train station, I'll be able to, without her knowing, just sit down and play something. I think that'd be quite cool. Oh, that is really, really cool. Um, so people kind of are talking a lot. There's a topic on everyone's lips. Of what is our biggest takeaway, our biggest learning and lesson from lockdown? What's yours so far? Uh, the, well, firstly, that I can survive on far less food than I thought I would. I mean, I, if you're that lazy about going out to the shops, it's amazing what rubbish is in my cupboards that I'm actually churning through. Um, I think for me, one of the, the big takeaways is about... It, it, it is about dating and relationships because it gives you a lot of time to think. It gives you a lot of time to think about who you are, what you want, what, what you value and, and what you want out of things. That For those who, who maybe don't know me, I, I also write a, a blog called a datingdad.com, excuse the plug, uh, and record a, a podcast called Swiped Out. And I was thinking about stopping those because they, they'd been kind of hurting my dating life with people not being willing to go on dates with me for fear of being exposed to the dating world and and have their kind of their personality taken through the blog and shared which is not what i do but the fear was there 
And I was wondering whether I should stop writing about dating, whether I should stop podcasting, whether I should stop recording content and, and being part of this world that actually has done so much good for me over the past few years. If it wasn't for this community that's kind of evolved, then I'd, I'd, I'd have been a much darker, sadder place over the last few years. And this lockdown period got me thinking to, to realize I want someone who, who shares some of my values and my, my dating persona, even if I'm only going to be dating one person, I still want to be there. I still want to help people who are having concerns about dating or relationships or love. I still want to do what I can to be part of that, as well as sharing loads of memes and, and random things that make me smile. So if they can't be part of that or be willing for me to continue doing that, then they're not the right person for me. And I shouldn't have to cut part of myself out to facilitate them. And, and that realisation, I don't know if it would have come about if it wasn't for lockdown then the amount of time I'm having to focus on myself. You know, earlier we were talking about how um, office recording and how when you show up on Twitter and on your blog, you are really the most authentic version of yourself. And that's probably why and how you've created such a community of singles or those who have been for a breakup or, or divorce who are navigating that path follow you and they connect with you and you say that you started that journey to kind of help yourself and that in my opinion there's no way you should shy away from that or hide away from that to appease somebody else because that kind of action normally leads to a sense of resentment or you know all of those kind of negative associations that we don't want to delve into but if you have to kind of hide away from I guess a creative part of your soul that just wants to get out there and share you know what what you're learning what you're taking away with other people helping them and helping yourself in the process and I, I think I think it's um it's almost sacrilegious isn't it I mean you're helping so many people and people really connect with you during a time of vulnerability now it's time that people do feel super vulnerable and um, as imagine going through a divorce right now or for a breakup and being either a cooped up with that person or be completely separate from them after many years being together or whatever you know you are kind of a voice that people want to hear from so um if it's hurting your dating life it's actually um just a perception because it's just pushing you know close those doors for people that you know weren't right for you anyway and leaving space for others who are I'm, I'm hoping that whilst it's hurting my dating life it's long term really helping my relationship life because uh, I want to and, and yeah I, I just I know that this is um, I, I'd love to meet the love of my life tomorrow um, today tonight I, in fact I want to knock on my door right <laughs> no I mean if, if the door had rung right then that would have been awesome but I'd love to meet her now because I, I miss, I'm missing all the days that I'm going to miss not knowing her so far. Um, but ultimately, I, heart attacks aside, I, I'm going to live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe more. And so if it takes me an extra six months, a year, two years, few years now to find the right person that's going to be right for me over the much longer period of time, then that's an investment I think I'm willing to make now. Short-term pain for long-term incredible gain. Um, so in this time of uh, being locked down and you're kind of paving the way to meeting a partner, a life partner, you're not just dating, not not like, you know, some people who are just swiping left and right, or as, you, as your podcast is, is called, swiped out, um, getting burned. What, um, I'm sorry, I think hmm, my headphones have just uh, died. One second. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Oh, I'm still connected, guys. Phew, don't <laughs> worry. Um, so, in, yeah, in this time of, of lockdown, have you been on any dates navigating the path to partnering? Uh, well, I've done a couple of things now. So uh, when lockdown started, I was in a relationship. And so uh, I went through that breakup whilst in lockdown and had to kind of deal with that. And it's it's a crap time to break up. It really is because you don't have the normal distractions. But like I said, rather than see that as a negative, even though it is, actually there are positives to come out of that. So um, once I'd kind of gone through those, I, I went on, uh, did a couple of speed dating things, you know, basically normal dating, just in your living room and I've got to say some of the people really they they 
they have no thought to how to how to speed date from their home. You've got people with kind of mess and, and rubbish behind them all around, terrible lighting so you can't see them, or holding the phone really close to their face or <laughs> around. Or, there's so many basic things that people are doing wrong in speed dating. Please, please, just think about the impression you're giving to people. Um, so you would say, is that like a top tip then, if we had to say that, you know, setting the scene, you know, creating the dating ambiance is really just as important as how you show up yourself. Definitely, because you're, you're giving them a window into your life, into your home, in a way that you would never do on speed date. And you turn up to a speed date and you can be dressed to the nines, wearing the most amazing dress and looking sharp and made up and, and smelling great and putting your best possible self. No one knows that your house is a mess and it's a state and that's because your life is all crazy at the moment. So you're trying to put this, this best version of you across. Now, if you're doing this from your home and you're sitting there in your pajamas um, with a, a two day old cereal bowl next to you on one side and you know, you're just kind of snuggled up with your slippers and a bar of chocolate. What, again, what impression is that giving about you? Yes, we don't want to show all aspects of our life right away, but you are showing more in that moment, in that speed dating, virtual speed dating moment than you ever would do on a normal date. So you've got to put that extra bit of thought into what people are going to see, how it's going to react and what impression that's given of you. I'm hearing a lot about people talking of online dating that they perhaps wouldn't normally do. I guess it's probably more apt to call it digital dating because uh, they might have met them through other means, but they're dating them, you know, digitally. Mm -hmm. What? How can you prepare your mindset for that? Is it the same way you would prepare your mindset if you were going out in person? How can you get your head around it all? I, th I think it really is the same sort of thing. I think there are so many transferables you can go over, but the one thing you need to have in the back of your mind is not to spend the whole time moaning about how frustrated you are, you can't see them, moaning about those things. Because every time you're saying, oh, I, I wish I could see you, I wish I could do this, then what you're doing is you you're putting that pressure on them that actually you're only interested in the physical side of things when actually there's so much about a relationship that is mental and it is emotional and it is something you convey through personality and you don't want people to be thinking about the the burgeoning relationship from all the about all the things you haven't got everything should be thought out in my opinion about okay well here's all the positives that we've got here's all the the ways we can make the most of this situation here's how we can do things that that aren't just about well, how quickly do we move from dating to sex to love to whatever? This is about building a much longer term, deeper connection that we wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't for lockdown. And it's not ideal. And I love, there's nothing like being like meeting someone in person to see how they move, how they act and, and so on. But we can't do that. And we shouldn't do that. So make the most of what we can do and see where it leads it's almost like old-fashioned courtship you know making its re-entry into modern dating you know because like you were just saying before if we're thinking about the future and it it can come across as though you're thinking about the physical side it perhaps shows how lust and the you know the the longing can cloud our vision from being fully present with the person and getting to know them. And um, how can you keep the spark alive, would you say, during the courtship? Well, I think you've got to start planning some activity stuff because there's nothing, I, I was chatting to someone uh, via a dating app and it got to the stage where it was every day, it's basically it was, so what do you do today? Well, I just kind of stayed at home, sat in the garden, read a book. What do you do? Well, I did some work. That's it. You've got nothing to talk about, no activity, nothing. And, and it becomes really dull, especially if you've only got one person kind of driving that conversation or, or thinking other things. So having dedicated date nights to look forward to is, is absolutely key. Yes, you can still stay in touch and you can chat and all those sorts of things. But just like in real life, you'd, you'd still message, you'd still text when you weren't seeing them, but you'd have something to look forward to. Not every night, but early stages of relationship, have those things to look forward to, whether it is... Uh, cooking the same meal together and sitting down eating it. A bit like you and I right now, just via a computer, so you're still enjoying that thing. Whether it is watching a movie together and, and messaging throughout or listening to music or doing something, going for a walk at the same time, even if you're not even socially dating, you're in totally different places. But having planned activities to do that you're going to look forward to and not trying to do them every night, but treat it like you would a normal dating relationship. The only difference is you can't get a cuddle at the end of it. 
Glenn, do you know what? I have just thought about you you being quite the conversationalist. You can hold a conversation very eloquently and you can just about entertain as well as converse with anyone from any background. So why don't we speak to the people who aren't as confident or aren't as uh, good yet of a conversationalist? Because I'm hearing a lot about how one side of the table is able to hold a conversation so well that they almost either resent or feel that the other person has had a, I guess, a shortcoming to the conversation through not adding a bit in or asking a question or making it diverse enough. So let's speak to the people who, who struggle to bring conversations to the table. What top tips could you give them to make it a free flowing two way street? Well, there's, uh, I, I've done a lot of communication training over the year, years and delivered an awful lot of training courses in that regard. And one of the, the key things that I've, I've made people remember is effectively there's three types of question. There's open, closed and leading questions. Now, closed questions are very much kind of the, the standard go to in terms of dating up. Oh, so uh, uh, did you go on holiday last year? Yeah. Where'd you go? Greece. Was it nice? Yeah, they're kind of yes, no. What's your favorite color? Um, have you seen this? And yeah, they can lead to more discussion and so on. But generally speaking, what happens is one side will be able to give all that. And then the other side will just give one word responses. Closed questions are useful when you want to find information out, but not much past that. Open questions are where real relationships happen and grow because you're setting them up in a way that's saying, well, here's something. What do you think about that? They're things that you can't really answer in one or two words. So when you're thinking about some questions, and one thing I would say, which is brilliant, a huge opportunity about virtual dating, for those who aren't confident about it, post-it notes. Because people can only see, and if you can see on the screen, what's in this little bit here. What they can't see is I could have post-it notes on the table, side of the screen. Here's a question you might want to ask. How about this anecdote you want to bring up? You can prepare the hell out of it and have it be really kind of, confident about I've got lots of stuff to, that I want to know about or, or ask about and you might never read them you might never think about them at all but it gives you a, a backup if you if you're feeling a little bit I, I don't know quite what to say next but open questions are the ones where if you're looking at that and you think right I could I could fully answer that in just less than a sentence kind of get rid of it the how what do you think about this or um, not just have you seen that did you enjoy how much did you enjoy this sort of thing um, but that also borders on the, the leading questions. Be careful about leading questions. These are ones where you're basically saying, this is what I think, you should agree with me. Now these are useful in some respects, it's, especially if the, if the person opposite you is, is themselves quite confident and they're confident and capable of, of, sh of saying, actually, you're not right, I don't, I don't agree with you on that. They're wonderful to be able to, to kind of play a bit of devil's advocate and so on. But what you don't want to is someone who's basically just going to agree with everything you say, because you know what, that's, that's really boring. Yes, you want some <laughs> that, but having someone just say, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Even when you know you're wrong is, is bad. <laughs> so think about those different... Cause and ruckus is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. just, have, just think about the different types of questions you can do. Post it, note the hell out of your surroundings and make use of that because you'll very quickly get into a, when it doesn't feel like you've asked a question in ages because you're just having a conversation, that's when you've won. And if you haven't asked a question in ages and you're still talking, wonderful. But if, if you get a little bit of a gap, just grab a post-it, just have a look down and, and bring something up. And it, it, it helps you get better at just managing the flow of a conversation. Well, another thing that's just come up to um, come into my mind is that we're in the midst of Mental Health Awareness Week. And I think we've never needed this week as much as we do right now um, with uh, friends on the front line in the police force of mine as well as in my coaching community at Love Lessons and just generally around with family and friends I have never seen so many people have such lows um, as we are seeing now so with that and it might not be your experience it's my personal and professional experience and um, could you give some kind of insights to how you stay positive and and kind of manage your routine to to navigate this tricky time 
Well, I think, I think firstly, it's, it is about having a routine. It, mm. it really it, it's such a simple thing, but achieving certain things give you the impression that you can achieve more. There's a, a classic video that did the rounds on, on all the social media channels about a year or two ago of if you want to achieve something, make your bed. Oh, I've just read that. It's so simple. Make your bed. It, it really is. And I, I find it. I find when I go through periods where I'm feeling more down and I'm feeling uh, lethargic and, and kind of upset and I just don't, just, I just want to close off and, and stop being part of the world, I realise genuinely I've not made my bed in weeks. And, Guys, and, and anyone that is watching this, that book is so thin and it's so practical that it has such condensed, tight routine to your life but it is able to give you a recap at the end it's so compact with info i'm so pleased you've just read that me too yeah uh, it just if the, the idea if you can make your bed that me that means that before you've done anything with your day you've achieved something and then if you can achieve that you can achieve the next thing whatever the next thing is and then you can just build up this level of achievement and the more you achieve the more you can achieve the more you do the more you do and so just having lots of little things you can do um, for me, it sounds weird, but yes, I, I like a tidy house. With kids, it's really tidy. <laughs> sometimes I might leave a job deliberately, consciously, until the next day. So that I've got, I know that all my other jobs are done. That's a tomorrow job. I'm going to have that tomorrow. So early on in the day, I can do that. Um, and so for me, it, it me, gives me a sense more of control. It means that I'm in control of my surroundings. I'm in control of all the things I can control. I can't influence anything else at the moment because there's three things you can either control influence or accept all the things i can control control those try and influence the things i can't and that that's things like work uh, and and staying in touch and, and those sorts of things and then everything that i can't either control or influence force myself to just say you know what i've just got to accept this i can't control the lockdown i cannot control it i can control my own reactions and I can influence the thinking of people around me, but I can't control whether we're allowed out or not. And so whilst that's out of my control, accept it. And as things change, then you can take control of those. Glenn, absolute delight. Thank you so much for being such a, a ray of light in what, for some people, single or not, feels like a bit of a dark time. And um, it feels like having spoken to you, singles can really thrive not just survive in you know this time of love being on lockdown where it isn't really you know you can still be enjoying the courtship but lust is put to one side for a moment and where can people find you you can find me on pretty much all the social channels the main one i'm on has to be twitter at the moment is a dating dad do put the a in front because there's an american one that they got there years ago and uh, he's not even dating anymore but still a dating dad on twitter or dating dad on instagram or you can use, look at my blog which is a dating dad.com thank you so much until next time literally my pleasure looking forward to it Stop recording.